Hey, happy Friday. This week, Nvidia made it pretty clear that they don't actually care about gamers all that much. Then a Chinese chip making company got into trouble and dragged Huawei and Apple along with it as well. And the sales of earbuds actually tanked pretty hard as well, plus many other things. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, we have a pretty fun one this week and we'll start the brief with some brand new products. First, Logitech dropped a bunch of stuff, and of course, I'm most interested in their $350 Android-powered Steam Deck clone designed for cloud gaming called the Logitech G Cloud. It runs a mid-range Snapdragon 720G, so it has no real horsepower of its own, but it should be plenty powerful for streaming games over Wi-Fi, and somehow it's already 50 bucks off while on pre-order on Amazon. Next, Razer announced the Leviathan V2X, which is a soundbar that will not take up too much space on your desk, but is also pretty cheap at just a hundred bucks. Then Amazon updated its Fire HD 8 tablet series this week and its base model Kindle last week, each now costing $10 more, but coming with improved specs, especially on the Kindle. If you want a cheap ebook reader or a cheap tablet, these might be worth a look now. Also this week, the company Framework, which makes modular laptops, just released their first ever Chromebook. There's a 12th generation Intel CPU and all the usual thin and light specs starting at $999, but the point of course is easy repairability and customizability, including through expansion cards, which give you the ability to choose which ports you want to add. And finally, Pico released the Pico 4, a new standalone VR headset that actually tries to challenge the Quest 2, both on specs and price. There is full color pass-through and 4K screens at 429 euros, and the company is owned by ByteDance, the makers of TikTok, so this is kind of like the Oculus Quest of China, made by the Facebook of China. We'll see if they can get the developer support behind the platform as well. Okay, that's it for all the new releases, and starting this week, I'll actually start putting links to each of the new products that we discussed in an episode down in the description. So if you want to check one of those out to buy for yourself, you can do so down in the description, and doing so might also help the channel out financially. Okay, beyond new products, Google this week confirmed that pre-orders for the Pixel 7 will start on October the 7th, and also that India will get the Pixel 7 after being skipped over for a couple of years as well. And Microsoft also confirmed that they will hold an event for their their Surface devices on October 12th as well. I'm not sure if my body is ready for Techtober to start yet, but uh, I guess it's inevitable. The Dynamic Island feature from Apple's iPhone 14 Pro is now available as an app that you can download on Android, of course, which sounds like it will work terribly. And in just massively what the F news, the investment banking giant Morgan Stanley also got fined $35 million after selling off a ton of hard drives and backup tapes full of sensitive, unencrypted customer data without wiping them clean for five straight years. If you're terrible with computers, I hear Morgan Stanley might be hiring for their IT department, so maybe apply there. Okay, that's it for my not brief brief, and for my first story of the week, we're actually gonna talk about Nvidia, who showed that they don't particularly care about gamers, but instead they really care about AI and data centers, I guess. So NVIDIA had their big conference called GTC 2022 this week, where on the one hand, they released the next-gen GPUs, the RTX 4090 and 4080. These are absolutely gigantic cards. The top-end model consumes an insane 450 watts, and they are ridiculously expensive as well, reaching prices up to $1,600 just for the GPU. There are a bunch of hardware upgrades as well as a 4 nanometer fabrication process by TSMC, and perhaps most importantly, there's also DLSS3, Nvidia's next-gen AI rendering tech that interpolates entire frames in advance now, not just pixels. DLSS3 is limited to the new generation cards, which gamers aren't exactly impressed with, and given the exorbitant prices, the internet is flooded with memes and opinions claiming that Nvidia has completely lost the plot and will be bulldozed by a AMD soon. But what gamers might not know is that gamers are no longer the main market for the company at all, as Nvidia makes much more money from data centers and other stuff these days, which are growing fast as well, while gaming GPUs are all in a freefall post-pandemic and post-crypto crash. 
So unsurprisingly, NVIDIA referred to GTC as an AI developer conference rather than a gaming conference, and they actually spent most of their time discussing their products for those markets as well. They revealed more details about the new H100 Tensor Core GPU for data centers, an RTX 6000 flagship GPU, which is aimed at the professional visualization market and content creators. They spilled the beans on their Drive Thor processor for self-driving vehicles coming out in 2024. And most interesting of all, or perhaps most boring of all, depending on who you are, Nvidia also unveiled two cloud computing services of their own. One is a cloud to run specific AI workloads on, like GPT-3, and the second one is called the Omniverse Cloud, which will specifically let companies run Metaverse apps on it so that they can be streamed to anywhere. And they're not talking about Zoom meetings in a 3D meeting room where your avatar has no legs, but something for industrial applications and interactive 3D modeling and simulation and digital twins. In other words, NVIDIA is trying to create a cloud company for itself kind of like Amazon has AWS or Microsoft has Azure. And so the company was kind of busy building that and all their other data center AI stuff instead of building stuff for us, the gamers, which is sad and boring for us, but maybe AMD will deliver. Okay, my second story of the week is going to be a weird one, and it's the US government potentially banning a Chinese chip maker who is the supplier of Huawei and could potentially become the supplier of Apple as well. So the company in question is called YMPC, which is China's memory chip making champion, who is trying to take on Samsung and the others in the NAND flash memory chip market, with lots of help from the Chinese government, of course. YMTC is still far from being a dominant player and doesn't even show up on market share charts that I can find, but industry insiders claim that they have some pretty promising technologies that might make them very competitive in the future. Anyway, they apparently supplied Huawei's Mate XS2 fold with their NAND memory chip without asking the US government for a license, which some US lawmakers are now claiming was violating US export control rules. And so they're close to put the company on the sanctioned entity list, which is the same naughty list that Huawei is on, for example. Now, how exactly one Chinese company supplying another with a random memory chip would be a breach of US export controls? I'm honestly too lazy to figure out. Like, maybe they use some US chip tech in their fabs or whatever, so they would fall under some rules. Again, I'm too lazy to find out, but anyway, there are some international repercussions as well. Apple in particular is getting into hot water as a result of this mess because the same lawmakers are actively threatening Apple now, which was planning to put YMTC memory chips into their iPhones. Apple said that it was only for some of their Chinese models, but they're now being worn off from even that. Anyway, it's a little unclear to me why anyone should be so freaked out about this specific company when neither they nor any other Chinese company have any significant market share in this field at all. But one US lawmaker even went as far as to say, quote, how can the world's data be secure if it is stored on a chip made by a CCP national champion? Which is a pretty dumb statement that shows just how silly this whole thing is. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of the CCP either, but a memory chip doesn't have a life of its own in your phone. It doesn't just call up the CCP and report you for doing something that it doesn't like. Plus, almost all devices these days encrypt their memory. So, uh, kind of whatever. Okay, my third story of the week is going to be that earbuds as a category have actually stopped growing pretty unexpectedly. It happened way faster than we were expecting, and the premium earbuds category is actually shrinking. IDC, CounterPoint, and Canalys have all recently put out various reports about the state of wearables. And while they disagree on the fine details, the overall picture is that hearables, like earbuds, are having a pretty rough time. IDC shows basically zero growth for the category as a whole. Canalys says that the category actually declined in all major markets, with the one exception being India, where it grew on the back of cheap units. And CounterPoint kind of agrees, only pointing out the growth in India as well. Either way, in India, it is a budget brands like Boat and Noise, as well as Xiaomi that are eating up the whole market. And in more affluent markets, sales are actually flat or even declining. 
This is in complete contrast to the pre-recession predictions that we got in the past, which said that we would reach up to 600 million pairs sold in 2022. In reality, we'll probably hit like half of that, so maybe 300 million units, and you can blame recessions, wars, inflation, or just good old market saturation. Other tech categories like fitness bands, phones, and PCs are also having a pretty rough time, so it's not just earbuds, but it's particularly striking just how abruptly the market went from a white hot crazy to just flat. And it looks like retailers are also starting to freak out just a little, with Amazon, for example, just having bumped up their affiliate rates from 1% to 4 to 9% on selected products like tech. Talk about dangling the carrots. Well, having like five times higher rates is definitely what got me into putting affiliate links down in the description to the products that we cover here. So well done, Amazon, I guess. If you want to check out any of the products that we covered, check those out down below. And uh, I'll see you next Friday.